Roald Dahl's Fantastic Mr. Fox was published in 1970, and, to be perfectly honest, it's just an alright book. One of his first, it's a harmless story for children without a whole lot in it for adult audiences. Which is fine, I suppose. Almost 40 years later, it was adapted by Wes Anderson and Noah Baumbach into an animated film, which, to be perfectly honest, is one of my favorite films ever. It's hilarious, it's emotional, it's a marvel of craftsmanship. And above it all, the two men breathed a very powerful message into the heart of the story about what it means to be a man. Today, we're doing a deep dive on the intersection of Roald Dahl's and Wes Anderson's visions in 2009's Fantastic Mr. Fox to unpack just how truly fantastic it is. For a bit of perspective on what was added and removed from the original story, I checked out the original book myself. And like I said before, it's a fine kid's book. Let me give you the rundown on what happens. In a tree in the woods, Mr. Fox lives with Mrs. Fox and their four small foxes. That's their proper name, apparently. It's capitalized like that in the book. Every morning, Mr. Fox asks his wife, what do you want for dinner? And she replies with either a fresh chicken from Mr. Boggus, a duck or goose from Mr. Bunce, or a turkey from Mr. Bean. This is of course not liked very much by the three farmers, a trio of nasty men who conspire to kill the fox to stop his raiding. So late at night, he pokes his head out to fetch dinner, only to find himself ambushed. He escapes with his life, but not his tail. It gets shot off in the gunfire. He laments its loss, struggling to sleep with the pain. But the farmers aren't done yet. They begin digging down into the foxhole. Mrs. Fox wails and laments that they'll all be killed with the children wide-eyed at their impending doom. But that's when Mr. Fox gets a brilliant idea, and they all dig their way down out of reach. They all rest, and Mrs. Fox turns to the children. I should like you to know that if it wasn't for your father, we should all be dead by now. Your father is a fantastic fox. But the farmers escalate in a kind of digging arms race. They bring in excavators to dig down farther and farther, so the foxes have to keep digging deeper and deeper. All the while, passersby jeer at the farmer's zealotry. They refuse to be swayed, though, and bring out their men to lay siege to what remains of the den. Three days pass, and starvation threatens to claim the fox family. But Mr. Fox finally comes up with an idea to save them all. He and the four small foxes start digging again in a new direction, but Mrs. Fox stays behind, more affected by the lack of food and water, and therefore too weak to help. Mm -hmm. The five others keep going, until they finally reach the destination. Mr. Fox checks, and is ecstatic to see that his sense of direction was flawless. They've hit Bogus' chicken house. Mr. Fox sends one of the small foxes back, wow, they're really not going to be named, are they? With a chicken for Mrs. Fox. Oh, what a fantastic fox your father is! Hurry up, child, and start plucking those chickens! As Mr. Fox continues digging with the small foxes, he runs into Badger, who tells him that all the woodland animals have been stuck underground as well, thanks to the farmer's siege. Mr. Fox realizes it's his fault. Badger furiously agrees with him. But to make amends, Mr. Fox invites Badger and all the displaced animals to a grand feast they'll have with the farmer's bounty. Mr. Fox continues his digging into Bunce's storehouse, taking fowl and bacon and carrots for the rabbits. As they begin to dig for Bean's farm though, Badger expresses concern. But Mr. Fox replies that the farmers are trying to kill them, so it's not nearly as bad. And in any case, they need to feed their families. This resolves the issue right away. They presently arrive at Bean's cider cellar, but the moment they remove one of the bricks, Rat pops out. He demands that they go away, a demand that they all ignore. He shrieks that they'll get caught, wanting to keep the cider to himself. A woman briefly comes down to the cellar, prompting them to hide, but she doesn't see them. That leaves Mr. Fox and his entourage free to escape, leaving behind Rat, who is still furious at having his cider poached. They return to Mrs. Fox, joined now by the entire community. Everyone is thrilled with the bounty, and cheers on Mr. Fox. I don't want to make a speech. I just want to say one thing, and it is this. My husband is a fantastic fox! Everyone digs in, delighted that they'll never have to go in the open anymore. And the three farmers are left keeping watch over the foxhole, never to see their quarry again. So that's a comprehensive summary. 
Again, not exactly a complicated book, I finished it in a sitting. It reads alright for children to be sure, but there's little to engage a more mature audience. It's most interested in the light whimsy of a fox doing fox things, and doesn't concern itself with things like characters and drama. But it was a starting point. Now, let's see what Anderson and Baumbach built off of it. The film opens with Mr. Fox under a tree in a cozy outdoor landscape, where he meets Felicity. Wow, she has a name in this movie. What a concept. Fox turns off his radio, and I'd suggest keeping an eye on this. It's a motif that pops up through the runtime. Right away, we can see Fox's cocky attitude on display. You take the shortcut or the scenic route? Let's take the shortcut. Oh, but the scenic route is so much prettier. Okay, let's take the scenic route. Great. It's actually slightly quicker anyway. The pair of them go raiding a farm together for squabs. They're clearly skilled at what they do, working in sync with incredible precision and speed. But Mr. Fox gets overconfident, activating a trap to show off, and it actually falls on them. At this point, Mrs. Fox makes a confession. I'm pregnant. If we're still alive, tomorrow morning, I want you to find another line of work. And this begins to add a far different context to the story. Fast forward to 12 Fox years, and the Fox family has settled into a peaceable domestic lifestyle. They have one son, Ash, reduced from the four small foxes from before. And he's, well, a little bit of a stinker. Well, I guess he's just... different. Mr. Fox is unhappy. His work as a newspaper columnist is unfulfilling. He's tired of living in a lowly hole in the ground. He wants to live in a more upscale tree, despite their modest means. So he goes looking for a new home, accompanied by Weasel, or, as I like to call him, Wes Anderson's persona. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much. Thank you. This is when we're introduced to Kylie, the mild-mannered possum, and also the three farmers who live nearby. And we can start to see the inkling of an idea in Fox's head. Fox's lawyer, Badger, attorney at law, warns Mr. Fox against buying the tree. He expands on the men, detailing their livelihoods and their quirks. Mr. Fox ignores the warnings, though, and moves into the tree. To recap, so far the film's already begun to build dramatic tension between Mr. Fox and other people in his life, fleshing out the story more, and adding new motivations and traits to make his character more interesting. And it's about this point, the B-plot arrives. Ash's cousin Christofferson comes to stay with them, and Mr. Fox can't help but remark on how impressed he is with the boy. He's taller, despite being younger, and more athletically inclined than Ash, perhaps reminding Mr. Fox of himself when he was younger, since it's established that he's a local school legend in Whackbat. And yet, in Mr. Fox's eyes, his glory days are waning. He misses them too much to bear, and so enlists Kylie into a scheme he's cooked up, to try and feel like his old self again. On the sly, he's going to do one last job, raiding the farms of Bogus, Bunce, and Bean. The first night goes swimmingly well, even if he does get spooked very briefly. Back in the old days, didn't we used to do a thing where if somebody saw a wolf, we would all... Wolf? What wolf? Huh. Nothing? Never mind. And the pair return with a sack full of chickens. Mrs. Fox begins to have her suspicions, but nevertheless, Mr. Fox presses ahead with the next part of his plan, hitting Bunce's waterfowl in the middle of the night. And real quick, I just gotta say I love the composition of this shot here. The way our eyes smoothly moves left to right across the screens as Bunce sits oblivious, this is inspired cinematography. His last and most dangerous target is Bean's Cider Cellar. As he heads out though, Ash tags along, insistent that he wants to help. Mr. Fox orders him back to bed, and waits for Christofferson instead, whom he believes will be more helpful. There's another scare on the way. Wolf, what's with all the wolf talk? Can we give it a rest for once? When they break into the cellar, they find a foe. Willem Dafoe, to be exact, voicing Rat. Bean security? What, why are you wearing that badge? What is it? It's my job. God, this movie's a delight. They manage to win out, though, and Mr. Fox returns home, his big job now complete. But when he gets there, he finds Mrs. Fox waiting very disapprovingly. If what I think is happening is happening, it better not be. Yet for the most part, it seems that he's gotten away with it. 
Unfortunately, he hasn't. The three farmers all convene at the direction of Bean. You might remember that this is where the book's main story started, and it goes largely the same, although there's a change made in the three men. In Dahl's book, they are crass, unhygienic, overall rather disgusting. Here, Bogus and Bunts are portrayed as mean but bumbling men. But Bean... Well, Badger describes him as possibly the scariest man currently living. And Michael Gambon really hits at home with his voice acting. The script, acting, and animation transform a nasty, dirty man into a gentleman with a quiet demeanor, a sharp tongue, and probably a plan to murder everyone he meets and get away with it. He has seemingly near-infinite resources, like he has a helicopter later in the movie? Being air, what does that even mean? How much does Bean really control? How far does his evil influence reach? All this to say, everything about this guy is delightfully evil, deliciously malicious, a perfect villain for the story. And he set his sights squarely on Mr. Fox. Perhaps we ought to kill him. And from here, the story begins to follow the book more closely. They stake out the Fox household. He pops up, and they open fire, shooting off his tail. But within the scope of this film, he simultaneously loses much more. Mr. Fox is incredibly glum about his tail being shot off. In fact, it seems to be less physical pain and more emotional pain. He finds himself unable to sleep without it, tossing and turning. And it comes up in later scenes as well. Oh, but Foxy, how humiliating. Having your whole tail blown clean off. Can we drop it? He's not just wounded, he's humiliated, even emasculated. It's not just a limb he lost, it's... Uh, wait, are tails limbs? It's not just an appendage he lost, it's his dignity and manhood. And we'll see that come together more as the film goes on. Shortly after the shooting, the farmers return to continue their attack, digging out the family, and Kylie. So they begin tunneling away, again like the book. As an aside, I have to point out how this film incorporates iconography from the book in its visuals, which is a lot of fun. It's a good way of bringing the source material to life on the screen. Anyways, back on track as the Fox family digs down. Mr. Fox begins trying to reach out to Ash, who seems sore about being left out of the heist. I'm sorry if you're feeling... You know what? I'm gonna just put dirt in my ears. Yeah, that's better. I can't hear you now, but keep talking. Finally, they reach a subterranean level and take a breather. But before he can say anything, Mrs. Fox asks for a word with him. They step aside, and she slaps him across the face with her claws. Twelve Fox years ago, you made a promise to me, and I believed you. Why? Why did you lie to me? Mrs. Fox is the polar opposite of her character in the book, and quite frankly, I consider it the greatest strength of Baumbach and Anderson's script. Rather than praising his every move, he or she gives out to him for what he's done, and she has every right to be upset. Mr. Fox tries to excuse himself. Because I'm a wild animal. You are also a husband and a father. His selfish actions have thrown his family into grave danger. And Bogus, Bunts, and Bean are only intensifying their efforts, setting a full-blown siege around what remains of the foxhole. Suddenly, Badger comes digging through the wall with the whole crowd behind him, startling the fox family. A lot of good animals are probably going to die because of you! Again, the confrontation is much more hostile than the book. It's not only his own family threatened by Fox's actions, but his entire community, and they all give out to him for it. Again, this really expands and adds onto the book. A simple external threat, Fox versus Farmers, has now branched into conflict with his wife, his son, his friends, and his own ego. This time around, he can't just wave it off and the extra conflict makes this movie much more interesting. Even Ash receives some of the ire, a bully from school taking the opportunity to torment him. But Christofferson intervenes. I can fight my own fights. No, you can't. Fox quickly tries to think and comes to an idea, sparking everyone to action. Just like the book, everyone digs at Fox's direction before he motions for them to pause. Can I just take a moment to point out how absolutely amazing the stop motion animation is here? I feel like that's been pretty self-evident so far, but just, I have to make at least one remark explicitly pointing it out. 
the designs, the colors, the composition, the actual animation itself. The film's absolutely a visual treat. Anyways, just like the book, they've reached the farmer's warehouses and have all the food and drink they could hope for. With everything they've stolen, the animals set up a massive feast at Badger's place, celebrating their bounty. And that's the end of the book's story. The farmers here, they've been bamboozled, and Mr. Bean finally snaps and flies into a rage. A clean victory for Mr. Fox. Until... I've got an idea. Back at the feast, the animals settle in and Badger raises his glass for a toast, before being cut off by Fox. But I guess we have... I'm sorry, maybe my invitation got lost in the mail. Does anybody know what this badger's talking about? <laughs> it's in this moment that we see that the story is, in fact, not finished yet. Despite all that's happened, Fox is still the same brash man that he was before. He snatched victory from the jaws of certain death and is eager to boast about it. The book ended at this point. He got in trouble because he was stealing food, and he wins by stealing more food. And that's the point he's at now, until his grand triumph is interrupted. Cider. Let's rewind a little bit to when Christofferson arrived at the tree. Almost immediately, tension arises between him and Ash, or at least from Ash's end. He's intensely jealous as everyone in his life becomes impressed with Christofferson. Again, he's taller, despite being younger, and he's more athletically inclined. Ash's attempts to similarly impress those around him often draw only muted platitudes or mixed dismissal. Christofferson, in the meantime, is roundly applauded. Yeah! Woo! That's the first time this kid's ever swung a whack bat? He really is your father's nephew, isn't he? Not by blood. No? He's from my mother's side. Oh, yeah. And we can hear Ash's insecurity begin to rise. Do you think I'm an athlete? What are you talking about? What, this? Oh, that's nothing. That's just some old trophy I won for being an athlete. Christofferson practices regular meditation. He's a dude-perfect trick shot master, apparently. And he even accidentally steals Ash's girl. And by that, I mean his lab partner. The tension even comes to a head when Ash snaps at Christofferson cruelly on his first night. But moments later, when he hears the boy crying, Ash comes down from his bed and switches on the train set, sharing it with his cousin. This quiet, wordless moment is so important. Ash isn't a bad kid. He's just scared. He wants to be validated by the people around him, especially living in the shadow of his father. His dad is the fantastic Mr. Fox, after all. Your dad was probably the best whack bat player we ever had in this school. And that's why he was so eager to tag along with his father on the heist. Why he was so upset that Christofferson was allowed along. Why, even despite his demonstrated ability to reconcile with his cousin, the pair of them still snipe at each other when the situation turns dire. However, once they find food and they are apparently enjoying a great victory, they bury the hatchet again, and Ash approaches Christofferson with a proposal. I just had a brainstorm for something fantastic I've got to do, but I can't do it alone. Hot off of their success over the farmers, they will sneak into Bean's house and steal back his dad's tail. Just like Mr. Fox, they wear their bandit hats, or at least Christofferson wears his. Ash still has to improvise. Once inside, they quickly get distracted by tarts on the counter, but the tail is nowhere to be found, until they see the television. Bean is wearing it as a necktie, but they're interrupted by a human finding them out. This is about the moment when the cider flood hits, and everything is washed away. Badger's mine, their food and drink, it's all gone. Fox's crowning moment is dashed away, and it gets worse when Ash comes running up to him. Oh no. Where did you get that nutmeg ginger apple snap? And why are you wearing that fake bandit hat? We went to steal back your tail. And in that moment, Mr. Fox realizes what's happened. Ash is taking after his example. In his determination to be just as daring, as bold, as acclaimed as his father, Ash copied exactly what Mr. Fox did. That is, do something reckless and dangerous. And it's landed Christofferson in the hands of the farmers. Mr. Fox retreats to reflect. And when Felicity comes to him, he has a confession to make. I think I have this thing where I need everybody to think I'm the greatest, the quote-unquote fantastic Mr. Fox. And if they aren't completely knocked out and dazzled and kind of intimidated by me, then 
I don't feel good about myself. This spills out the film's theme in no uncertain terms. A theme about social pressures often exerted on men in our own real world. From an early age, there's often high expectations about what it takes to quote-unquote to be a man. There's a pressure on every man in our world to be fantastic or else be a failure. And that pressure can lead men into doing dangerous and unhealthy things. There is an expectation to fit perfectly into an accepted male archetype, and deviation from that is frowned upon or even actively discriminated against. So weaknesses are hidden away, papered over, distracted from. This is what Baumbach and Anderson turned Fantastic Mr. Fox into. The simple children's story becomes a parable about a father, his son, and how they both struggle to define themselves. Mr. Fox sits down with Ash, and they share a powerful moment. And notice how while the playful comedic side isn't completely washed away, it still feels natural with these characters and their relationship. So we dug, and the whole time I put paw over paw, scooping dirt and pebbles with your mother digging like crazy beside me, I kept wondering, who is this little boy gonna be? Or girl. Or girl, right, because at that point we didn't know. Ash, I'm so glad he was you. It's not your fault. It's mine. With that, Mr. Fox decides to surrender to the farmers, sacrificing himself with the hope that they'll give up their siege and let the rest of the animals go. He departs, and everyone starts looking for a way out of the sewers. But they come across an old foe, Willem Dafoe. Mr. Fox, we have your son. If you ever want to see him alive again... You took the wrong fox. I'm his son. When Rat realizes their error, he decides to rectify it by attempting to kidnap Ash. Mr. Fox hears the commotion, though. Everyone puts up a stiff defense, but it's ultimately Mr. Fox who manages to fight off Rat, and the rodent is killed in a tussle in the electrical grid. What follows is a delightful farce of a scene, a parody of dramatic deaths, if you will. Rat has a grand final moment choking out Christopherson's location as well as his last request, tears in his eyes. And then... Oh. Ash remarks that he's been redeemed. Redeemed how, and for what, we don't know. Mr. Fox speaks a somber eulogy, and they float him down the river to sad music, before Kylie finally comes in to knock the whole hollow thing down. He went bananas. Yes, he did. It's great. The incident has rekindled Fox's fervor, and he begins to rally everyone. He believes that if they all join together, they can beat back the farmers, rescue Christofferson, and save their hides. And this completes the other side of the theme of masculinity, because it doesn't have to be a negative quality. While it can be a force for ill, it can also be a force for good. In this moment, Fox realizes he can use his gifts to undo his mess and save his community. He invites everyone to recognize their own strengths. Fox can't save the day alone, but if they work together, then they have a chance. And the first person to join him? I will. Mr. Fox sends a reply to Bogus Bunsen Bean, stating that he intends to hand himself over. Down below, Fox hands out bandit masks to all his colleagues. And the standoff begins. The tension in the air is palpable. The music builds everything up. Each side tests the other a bit, until finally... Fox makes his move, rushing to a motorbike with Kylie and Ash in tow. They make it to Bean's compound, and while Fox distracts a rabid guard dog, Ash finds his cousin locked in a box. With no way to unlock it, Christofferson offers a crash course in basic martial arts. Position yourself on the balls of your feet, close your eyes, you weigh less than a slice of bread. Ash unfortunately flunks the course, but breaks the box open anyways. In this moment, he also offers an apology of his own. I'm grumpy. I spit. I wake up on the wrong side of the bed. I'm just... different, apparently. But it won't happen again. Chris Arverson, I'm sorry. He may not be perfect, he may not always be good, but that doesn't mean he's not a good boy. And in this moment, he shows that he's grown to be a better boy. The four make for the escape, 
but in their path is Mr. Bean and his entire army. The whole area darkens, and Mr. Fox sees that the man is wearing his necktie. Fox is determined to get back that necktie. Kill him! A task easier said than done. But in this moment, Ash gets to shine. I weigh less than a slice of bread. He runs off, and as he goes, all different bits from the movie start to converge together, payoff after payoff. Finally, he knocks the knob off the door and digs down just like his dad showed him. And with that, the rabid dog is unleashed, chasing down Bean and his men, giving the Fox family, and Kylie, cover to escape. Ash, that was pure wild animal craziness. You're an athlete. Mm-hmm. Here, put this bandit hat on. The dog pounces on Bean himself and grabs Fox's tail, the last shred of his old pride, and turns it into shreds, plural. With that, all thoughts turn to escape, which they do in spectacular fashion. At long last, Bean is out of ideas. As they drive home, though, they get distracted by something in the distance. A wolf, what Fox has always been scared of. And yet, in this moment, he doesn't show fear. He tries to speak, but gets back no response. But finally, they manage to find a common language. In this moment, Mr. Fox solidifies the new peace he feels with himself. His selfish actions in the beginning he tried to excuse by describing himself as a wild animal, a side of himself he felt powerless to control, hence his fear towards wolves through the movie. But now, he no longer fears the wolf, just as he no longer fears his own wildness. He is a renewed master over himself. Two and a half Fox weeks later, we see the aftermath. Bagus, Buns, and Bean keep up a fingless watch. They alone convinced they still have a chance to catch Mr. Fox. And while food is becoming a concern, Mr. Fox finds a solution. A hatch leading up to the Bagus, Buns, and Bean International Supermarkets. There's plenty of food to support everyone. One last heist, this time truly for everybody's benefit. And this is when Felicity drops a last bombshell. She's pregnant again. To celebrate, Mr. Fox does one last toast. They say my tail needs to be dry cleaned twice a month, but now it's fully detachable, see? They say our tree may never grow back, but one day something will. Yes, these crackles are made of synthetic goose, and these giblets come from artificial squab, and even these apples look fake, but at least they've got stars on them. Their lives are dramatically different, and in a sense they've lost a lot. There's no luxurious tree looking over the fields, but they still have a home. They may not feast on fresh fowl or beans personal cider, but they still have food, and ultimately, they have each other. The entire fox family, and Kylie, is together and alive, with another small fox on the way. The film ends with a celebration of the mundane over the extraordinary, and while they may not have a fantastic life, they still have a life, and that's pretty fantastic in itself to our survival. And to finish it off, the radio is turned on, this time by Ash, passing from father to son.